Um, I'm going to introduce our next our next speaker. So our next speaker is Joanne Butler, Vice President of Electricity Resources for the Ontario Power Authority. Ms. Butler is currently Vice President of Electricity Res Resources at the Ontario Power Authority. I just said that. <laughs> Prior to joining the OPA in 2008, Ms. Butler was President of Trans Alta Mexico, where she was responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the business, including supporting business development and contracting activities, as well as the ongoing operation of the many companies to Mexican electricity generating plants. <laughs> Prior to moving to Mexico in 2001, she was TransAlta's general manager for Western operations in Calgary and was responsible for the operation of four new generating stations. Ms. Butler was also, sorry, also worked in the oil and gas exploration sector with Amoco, I don't know if I said that right, um, uh, corporation for 21 years. She holds a Bachelor of Science Honours degree in Civil Engineering. She is an executive of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce for her six years in Mexico. She has a Chartered Director designation from the Director's College and is currently a board member of the Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health Sciences and WICS and a Technical Standards and Safety Authority TSSA of Ontario. In 2013, Ms. Butler was one of the top 100 Canada's most powerful women in the public sector leaders category. That in for Wow, right? It's always amazing when people talk about you how they sound so much better than really they <laughs> Anyway, I know I stand in the unenviable position of you just finishing your lunch, so don't turn the lights down, and the fact that you probably all do want to get back to your offices by 1 o'clock. So I was asked to come and speak to you today about any energy storage in Ontario. So I just want to uh, start out uh, a little bit talking about the Ontario Power Authority. So we are here to ensure a reliable, cost-effective, and sustainable electricity supply for Ontario. Uh, we do the long-term system planning, we procure new supply, we uh, enable conservation across the province. And I'm responsible for the meeting, middle one, designing the procurements, uh, managing and settling all the contracts, and uh, looking at the policy analysis, what's happening in the energy world, out, out and about. And, and this is, uh, so I want to put a plug in for Durham region. I live in Whitby, I'm, a, I'm a very proud member of uh, that community and proud to be on the Board of the um, Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health. And I'm very proud of the fact that Durham Region has such a commitment to energy, whether it's the nuclear facilities, uh, the, the energy from waste facility, which I hold that contract for. I know there's solar, I know there's wind in this region. And, you know, I'm in the position where I'm in a lot of places, you know, having contracts where a lot of people don't want to have anything in their region. So I think everybody in Durham should be very proud of the commitment that they have to energy. Um, and then, I, as you may also know, the uh, Ontario Power Authority will be merging with the independent electricity system operator at the end of this year. So then, not only will we, will we be operating the system on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, from very short-term planning to long-term planning, to emergency preparedness, to conservation, we'll be covering the whole gamut uh, of, uh, of that specter in the province. <coughs> so. Um, you also want to know a little about the long-term energy plan. So the vision for the future of, of, uh, of electricity is clearly set out in the government's long-term energy plan. It was updated about a year ago. It's a, basically a blueprint of our activities. And, uh, the, and it will continue on as we merge with the new organization as well. And the key elements are conservation first. And I know everybody realizes that the cheapest megawatt of electricity we have is the one that we don't use. So that's why we have to watch our energy conservation and, and uh, turn those lights out, get those LEDs, et cetera, et cetera. Continued rate mitigation efficiency efforts. I mean, obviously, price impacts, cost impacts are starting to hit a lot of people. We call it bend the cost curve. The minister is very conscious of trying to do that. Enhanced regional planning, which regions like Durham will be involved in what kind of electricity they want, where they want it, et cetera, et cetera. Again, in efforts to site facilities better and and understand what municipalities and stakeholders and communities want. Electricity procurement, I will continue to do that. I have the <coughs> contract for the Bruce Power 
I have every three kilowatt microfit contract in the province as well. We have over 28,000 contracts and, all, and $36 billion in private investment. Transmission enhancements, as you all know, we need to build out our transmission system. It's aging and we need to connect new generation. Aboriginal engagement is very key for this province and for this government. Energy innovation and then storage. And then storage is the one that I'm going to be talking about to today. And in the, in the LTEP, it provided uh, a, num a number of initiatives to help energy storage. It, uh, first of all, they wanted us to go out and figure out what to do with it. They wanted to, us to address any regulatory barriers because there are regulatory barriers to storage. And then they wanted us to go out and do a procurement. So this is ex pretty much precisely what we're doing. But first of all, what is energy storage? There's really no universal um, definition of energy storage. You know, we can store water, we can store gasoline, we can store gas, we can even store liquid gas, we can store lots of things. But energy, electricity storage has been something that we've worked on for many years to try and figure out how to do. And um, the electricity system works on a minute-to-minute -minute real time operation. It's not, it's a very intricate system to, to keep moving so that everybody gets their generation on time. And it doesn't actually produce energy. It basically moves it around. It uh, stores it and moves it from low peak to high peak, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and it also is a load and it's also a generator and that's where some of the regulatory barriers come in. But our current definition is the ability to absorb electricity, store it for a period of time, and re-inject it into the grid when it's needed most. I'm sure you've all seen some of the most common energy technologies, but flywheels are a big one, the big canisters that spin. And they're in kilowatt size uh, type storage, and they're good for frequency regulation and ancillary services on the grid. Batteries, basically chemical batteries that store energy in them put it back through as electricity. We've got lithium ion. Uh, flow batteries are the next new uh, thing in batteries. They're actually, it's liquids with certain electrolytes in them and a membrane and they flow across and you get more cycles out of it. So that's a technology that we need to be looking at. Pumped hydro is basically Adam back, I'll show you a picture later, down on Niagara Falls. You pump the water up to the reservoir when the electricity rates are low and you let it out and through the turbine when the electricity rates are high. Compressed air energy, uh, that's another, we basically compress <coughs> gas stored in caverns, so there's some down in the Sarnia area and other places. And then again, when you need the, the electricity, you unleash the pressure and run it through a gas turbine and, and produce, or a, a turbine and produce electricity. There's thermal storage where you either have a, a, hot, a hot or cold medium, and then the medium is used to offset load. So if you have ice and you need a lot, air conditioning, you can use that. If you have hot water, heat, and you need heat, you can use that. And then power to gas, that's just where you uh, t make hydrogen out of water and then use the hydrogen uh, and burn it later to generate electricity. So here's some of the technologies I talked about. This one, uh, Temporal Power is a Canadian company. That flywheel technology is currently in use in the province. The ISO has used it for ancillary services. It's a 500 kilowatt. Uh, it reacts very. Sorry, Joanne, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. I'm closer to the mic. This is Sorry. Sorry. So, flywheel technology reacts very quickly. Um, so, and we do have some in service right now. I talked about Sir Adam Beck, that's down at Niagara Falls. I talked about the flow battery. I was just down in California and actually went to see a company that was making them. It's very exciting technology that we need to be cognizant of. And the Tehachapi Battery Project, that's one that was just commissioned in California. The California, as you know, has lots of solar and is really a championing storage as well. And they're big investor-owned utilities, of which Southern California Edison is one, just put into service this Tehachapi Battery Project. And it's, um, it's 8 megawatts over 4 hours. You can store 8 megawatts for over 4 hours, so 32 megawatt hours. It's over 600,000 individual cells, and it sits in a 6,300 square foot building, and it's all lithium ion batteries. But it's, I mean, it's a good start. Um, and then I talked about Sir Adam Beck.
Okay, so what are the benefits of energy storage? And there are lots of benefits. Um, so as I talked earlier, there's a revenue stream. It, uh, it's basically arbitraging, which is time shifting of energy. So you buy energy at low prices and then you sell it back to the market at a higher price. There's ancillary services, which I talked about more for grid support. There's operating reserve if we had a big downshift in, in generation. Uh, we can de defer investment if we have storage, and especially at peak times, and maybe we don't need to build a, a, a gas turbine peaking generation plant like the one we built out in New York. Uh, so there's good, that's good in terms of deferring investment. And then uh, grid flexibility. This is important too because it will regulate power fluctuations, maintain power quality, and keep costs down. It can really help with renewables. Because you know, the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time. And sometimes when you want the wind to blow, it doesn't. Uh, or you, when you don't want it to blow, it does. So with a, a storage facility, you could take all that energy storage and store it and then unleash it again when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining. So there are benefits to it. Um, these are some graphics. Um, again, these might put you to sleep because it is after lunch. But the energy time shift, that's exactly arbitraging, right? You, you start when the energy's at low prices, and then when you need it, you bring it forward and you sell it at high prices. Uh, ancillary services, that's very good for a grid operator. All those little tweaks that go up and down it nice and smooths it out. That's what your flywheels can do and help with. Deferral investment, that's what I was talking about, the peaking plant. You can store all that energy and when we go home at 5 o'clock in the summer and turn on our lights and our air conditioning, instead of firing up a new gas turbine or a peaking plant, if we could inject all the energy that we've just stored, then we would, that would delay investment. And then it's very good for ramp rate, for very quick up and down in the, in the, um, in the electricity system. And that's also good with the renewables as well because sometimes a cloud comes by quickly or the wind drops very suddenly. And so you need something to ramp in and ramp up and, and keep the system running smoothly. <coughs> but as with anything new, uh, new technology, there are, there are always challenges. And right now, economics is one of them because the conventional assets that we do have already do provide some of these types of services, like Sir Adam Beck, so, like some of our gas peaking plants like Quebec, which is a seasonal storage because they peak in the winter and we now peak in the summer because of our air conditioning loads. So there's natural storage already occurring. And a lot of these technologies have not been demonstrated on a commercial <coughs> scale, but we're hoping to fix that. And then um, regulatory charges, as I said earlier, because they're a load and a, and a <coughs> supply, when you're a load, you pay certain demand charges, global adjustment and other charges and, and you know, is that really fair when you're going to send it back into the grid? So we're looking at that. There's a smart grid advisory committee that's going to do that. And then there's really no way right now to monetize the benefits of storage. And what we're finding is a storage application has to do more than one thing. It, can, it, has to, it can't just sort of be a standalone ancillary services. It's going to have to do operating reserve. It might do ancillary services. It might do something else. It might shift. So those are all the models that we're looking at. So um, we have started down the road in Ontario, and it is quite exciting. And we are we are very much early movers. As I said, I was in Ontario or in California, which they're obviously been starting on it. But Ontario as well. In that, in December 13, the the government requested the OPA and the ISO to look very seriously at storage and go out with a 50 megawatt pilot. And that's right what we're in the middle of doing right now. So in March, the ISO, uh, they were allocated the first 35 megawatts, and they um, had some successful applicants. They're there on the slide. And they're finalizing the contracts and currently under negotiation with the following organizations. And I'll explain the difference between the two procurements in a moment. And then the OPA, we're taking a little bit of a different view, but again, we're working very collaboratively together. We have the other 16.46 megawatts, and we're trying to maximize the learning, as I said, and explore the commercial arrangements about how these energy storage solutions would work. And we want it to more provide capacity, so long-term storage, uh, and demonstrate that ability to time shift from low value to high value, and we want to try and break down these regulatory and other barriers. We have a two-stage process. We start with an RFQ, a request for qualifications, that is out in the street right now. 
And th this is intended to qualify the applicant, not the, pro the project itself. And so the applicant has to have storage experience somewhere in the world on the technology that it's applying for. It needs to have experience in Ontario in some facet of the electricity system. And it needs to have a certain net tangible value, t tangible wealth, so that we want these projects to go ahead and we want them to actually be successful. And so that RFQ submission is November 21st. And uh, we're hoping to notify the applicants in January. And shortly after that, we'll be looking at a request for proposal, which will take in all the feedback and stakeholding that we've got and the results of the RFQ to design a really good uh, a request for proposal. So you're asking, OK, so what's the difference between the two of them? We're focusing on technologies that are providing solutions to long-term capacity needs and time shift the energy. So multiple po technologies that deliver power for multiple hours at a time, like the Touch Bay one, which is four hours of, uh, of uh, storage. And we want to find a diversity of storage technologies, and we want to learn how to contract for them, how to do the right thing around them so that they can become, ultimately, very commercial ventures. Mm -hmm. The ISO is, for, is more focused because they are the grid operator and worried about that minute to minute, second to second. Um, they're, they're focusing on technologies that deliver those powers in those very small um, time frames. So as with anything that we do, we never go out without doing as much stakeholding as we can. And we have been informed there is an Ontario Energy Storage Alliance there are young startups, companies in this province now that are working in the storage field. We've got, we've done a lot of, we've had a lot of conversations with them, a lot of stakeholder engagements. We're interested in feedback. Uh, we've asked a lot of questions. Um, people can tell, still subscribe if this has piqued your interest. You can come and subscribe for updates, and we'll notify you of anything more that we're doing in this area. And you'll see the uh, the website there on the bottom. And then I'll just do this in. This is the US Department of Energy Global Energy Storage Database. And it's every storage um, project built around the world. It's voluntary. Uh, they, they, uh, <coughs> it provides information on the technology type, the stored energy size, the project lifetimes, and capital costs. And this is where we go in as we go out and inform ourselves how to do the right thing around these procurements. This is an excellent source of information for policymakers, for startups, for people who want to understand what's going on, and, and investors in the business. So those are all the slides I had. You know as much about storage, basically, as I know now. Um, it is exciting, though. We, we don't want it to be the new cause celeb. We want it to be something that we can really get our teeth into, make it a very valuable resource for this province. We see a lot of opportunities to use it wisely. And um, again, if you're really interested in how it's going, please subscribe and you'll be getting updates. You'll see who gets qualified. You'll see what the RFP looks like. You'll see what the contract looks like, et cetera, et cetera. And that will be more in the, the first quarter of 2015. So with that, I'll take any questions. And if there's any other questions you want to ask about the OPA, I know we've got a few minutes. I'd be more than happy to do that as well. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if we had done or OPA had done anything with regards to protecting uh, the uh, power generating uh, systems. Uh, in California, you mentioned California PG&E uh, Metcalf substation. Yeah. Uh, someone took 100 yeah. hot shots at it yeah. and uh, cost millions and millions yeah. of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any kind of a program that works for that? Okay, that would be more the ISO bailiwick. I'd probably be able to tell you more about that in January when we're all together. But so I, I know in working with my ISO counterparts, security is incredibly important for the grid at large and where they're situated, where their office building is, to get in and get out, there's incredible security. Do I know personally, and probably if I did, I wouldn't be able to tell you anyway what the, the security aspects are. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't honestly know other than I know it's <laughs> IT in the ISO is massive, IT security as well, and physical security of our assets is very important. Now what they've done is, uh, in California, they've 
created a specification for ballistics uh, has now become a level eight ballistic uh, level uh, right throughout California. I was curious if, uh, if we had any plans or consideration of doing similar thing. So not to my knowledge, again, the OP doesn't own or operate any assets. The owners of those transformer stations and transmission lines are basically hydro one and your own distribution companies. Uh, I suspect they would probably be looking at, at some sort of, of those sort of things, to, but in my purview, what I do, and I, I'm not aware. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. What would be the schedule for the next round of procurement of uh, storage services? Like, you talked about 50 megawatts now, 35 megawatts for the ISO, 16 or so for the OPA. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the sort of criteria for evaluating whether or not it's been a success, and when would the next window open for uh, Okay, so I would suspect we're going to conclude our 16 megawatt storage uh, sometime, in, I would hope, by the half, first half of, or the third quarter of 2015. We will evaluate that. Like I said, we're looking for, you know, what kind of market mechanisms well, is going to make this work. Are we getting what we want? Are we getting the you know large-scale storage that can help with intermittent renewables? Oh, the one thing I forgot to mention as well for storage might be very useful is on microgrids. Storage might be a perfect application for remote communities in the north. There's 24 remote communities up north that are not connected to the transmission system. We have a business case that connect about 20 of them. There's three or four of them that can't be, it's not really economically um, viable to connect, but, but a wind or a solar and a storage facility might be exactly what that type of community needs. So I, I, the short answer is I'm not going to commit to any time frame, but if we get some really good immediate results at a really good competitive level, and we can figure out a market structure that makes it a win-win for everybody, I think we would certainly be moving forward more, not on a pilot scale, but more on a larger scale, and maybe integrate it with our next large renewable procurement, you know, our next wind and solar or biomass or water procurement. So I, I can't give you a deadline, but I can tell you that if it's successful, what we get in our pilot, we'll be absolutely pursuing it. What percentage, uh, what percentage is wind and solar supplying now on the specific the province of Ontario? Okay, on a, on a capacity basis, I should have brought all my notes with me. I, I, don't quote me if I get it wrong. But So right now, nuclear supplies about 50% of our energy. So when we talk about electricity, we talk about it in terms of energy, we talk about it in capacity, right? Capacity is the number of megawatts that's out there physically sitting. Like there's 5,000 megawatts of wind, there's 2,000 megawatts of solar, there's 9,000 megawatts of water, there's 11,000 megawatts of nuclear, and there's 8,000 megawatts of gas. I think I got that right. Somewhere along the line, it adds up to about 36,000 megawatts of, of, of capacity that we have to call it in the province. But as I said earlier, not all that capacity is going to be there when we need it, right? Nuclear and water have been, we call it from nuclear to Niagara, they've been our base load. They are there 90 plus percent of the time when we need them. Um, the wind and the solar are intermittent, so the energy that they supply is a lot less than the capacity that they, than a, a nuclear plant, right, or a water because of the intermittency of it. And gas is there as a mid-level type of facility. Gas basically replaced coal. And as you know, going off coal was the biggest climate change initiative in North America, and Ontario should be very proud of that. And so we, um, by, by taking the coal and they were quick ramping, they were good services, we more or less replaced that with gas. So in terms of capacity, so wind and solar are about eight together, uh, water is about another nine, so about half of our capacity in terms of the energy that's available. It would be significant. It would be less than that, maybe twenty or thirty percent. Well, well, except the water would be actually quite high. The wind and solar would be probably maybe twenty or thirty percent.
Okay. Well, Joanne, thank you so oh, much. Thank you very much.